Washington's first round of portal targets are emerging. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Locked On Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He's site editor with Athlon Sports is inside the Huskies. I'm the site editor with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the days. We are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Lars, we got a really fun show coming at all our everyday today. We're gonna talk about some basketball. We haven't talked about some recruiting on the basketball side of things. The team itself, we got a lot that we need to get to from that. We got to talk about what a couple guys that. What might leave Washington? We saw Jack McAllister announce his uh, intentions to depart on Monday. We have a feeling it won't be the last. We're not, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get that discussion. But we've talked about some early transfer portal targets. But Lars, just a reminder to all the everydayers out there, make sure you like this video, comment down below, and make sure you hit that subscribe button as all those things are really do help us out a lot. If you're audio only, a five-star review it really goes a long way towards helping our channel. We really do appreciate it. But Lars... The, all the everydayers, they're all here because they want to hear about some of our early transfer portal targets. As the the exodus from various programs around the country has begun, who are some names that you might be looking at saying, I'd like to see this guy in purple and gold? Well, so, I mean, I don't, we're going to piggyback off of this one because I don't want to steal it from you. But I, the one that the, the name that jumps out right away is Jackson Bowers. Like, yeah, it if, is. if you don't get one Bowers where you... <laughs> We're kind of an American let's, back in let's, let's not cause me pain, please. And and all the time, no, but I mean, I'm just Brock still impressed. Like here. No, but I'm just still impressed that that was even in consideration given the state of the program and everything in that sense. But you look at what Washington needs at that tight end position. Jackson Bowers, like, I don't know what the number would need to be, but that just seems like the easiest solution because you still have Decker, you still get um, sure. Austin Simmons, and you still get um, the kid from Oregon. Baron Baron Allen, I was like the other kid from Oregon. It's like they're too many kids from Oregon at this point. But like those, neither of those two guys. Because I remember asking Austin Simmons, "Hey, you know, they could have taken a portal guy in, in the transfer portal at your position. They still probably will." And Jackson Bauer is like the perfect. Like I could not. Say, you look at the guys that probably will enter the portal at that position. I think that guy is top three overall in terms of guys to go get. I like that. I think that's a really good one. Let's stick at tight end for a second where this is going to lead to a broader discussion that you and I are going to monitor the situation, see what happens. And it's Dorian Thomas at Arizona, where that's a kid who is from up here. He's from Kent, but another guy who entered the transfer portal was mulling doing that a little bit earlier on, obviously chose to stick the season out at Arizona. And that's something where it, it has a broader discussion topic that you and I want to make sure we get to at some point over the course of the week. It's what's that roster going to look like? Who's going to go to the draft? Who might come back and enter the transfer portal? And who, honestly, like just to just be real, who might follow Jed? Like that's really this, the discussion when I think about Arizona's roster. And, you know, it's we're not going to get any names until we, you know, hear more things very clearly from them. But that's what I'm, what I'm really curious about because all the names we're going to talk about today are guys that are already in the transfer portal. So Dorian Thomas is one where he hasn't been super productive down there, but obviously Jordan Pau Pau really liked him, really wanted to make sure that that was a guy he took out of high school and maybe he still wants to work with him. So I'm really curious to see what it looks like at tight end, but the one position is defensive tackle. Like that's the one we've been harping on since the Oregon game. That's really, really important. And the guy that I'm really curious about is Gabriel Lightfoot, where that's a guy from Fresno state where he's been really productive down there. He's been a starter down there for, over two years, I want to say, if I remember right from looking at his numbers. And that's somebody where I don't necessarily know if that's going to be like a top end take where you mentioned to Hemo, Otis. I know that's a guy you want to make sure we, we discuss in the show as well. But I think about Lightfoot and I say, when we talked about a deep rotation of talented bodies, that's a guy that would fit that mold really, really well, where it's a step up for him from, for, from the group of five. And depending on who else you want to take around him, you don't have to look at that right away and just say, all right, we're going to rely on you like Sebastian Valdez. It's no, we've got Javon Parker. We've got Alinius Davis. We got all these other guys that we want to rely on to take a bigger step forward in the rotation. And that's a guy who I think fits that really well in terms of he can come in, still play 15, 20 snaps a game, whatever it is you want to call it and be really productive. And you don't have to all of a sudden just, you know, over, overwhelm him with things. No, I agree. Cause I think, the more you think about it, and I'm glad you kind of harped on it, especially in yesterday's show, the depth really can't be understated because you see what happens when you get injuries. It's like 
I think we're more curious why Bryce Butler didn't get, you know, more reps this season than we expected him to. But I think this year was also a feeling out process for some of the guys and might as well give Jacob Bannis most of that. Sebastian Valdez, a guy who wants to go to the NFL, potentially could come back, but probably could go to the NFL. We'll end up going to the NFL. I'm not saying one way or the other, but just it seemed like given sure. how many reps he was getting this season, you know, Linus Davis was like the guy where, hey, like, you know, you, another guy that's upcoming. So you don't, when you mentioned defensive tackles, that's why I like, you know, Otis, but also you maybe compare him with the guy from Pennsylvania State, where they're two different types of players. <laughs> and for that reason, you can take both, but one prioritize over the other. So that way you still don't neglect the guys that you have coming up on the roster because there's a lot of talent at that position, but it's just young and inexperienced talent we necessarily haven't seen. Right. And that's the thing where, you know, with a player like Otis, it's about getting more of just that caliber of body. Like that's the biggest thing is getting these big talented dudes that you trust your coaching staff to say, Hey, we want to develop you, whatever that might look like, whatever we think you need to do better. We want, we want to make sure you do it here. And it also goes back to a really interesting point that uh, was on the Con Cowherd podcast, actually a little bit earlier today, where he was discussing the Ohio State Michigan game. And later on in the show, he brought up Washington and their NIL fund. And he said, hey, I've heard some things that Washington didn't necessarily spend very much in this last offseason because they were looking to do it all this year. And obviously with the spring portal, you didn't want to go super hard, whatever, whatever it is you want to call it under Jet Fish. So it's really interesting to hear it from some of those national guys. But one guy where I think that that could become a big discussion is along the offensive line, where, where we want to close out here. And that's uh, Luke Becklenko, who's the Stanford offensive tackle who decided to enter the portal. And he's somebody who I'm really curious about where there are a lot of players along the offensive line that we've already seen enter the portal where you can say, oh, this is an you know all insert group of five conference player here. This is an all FCS level player here. This is somebody who was a really highly rated recruit, but is looking for a new opportunity because he hasn't developed the way he wanted to or whatever the reason might be. Backlanko is one of those guys who he was really good down at Stanford. And it's one of those things you stay on the West Coast. Obviously, if you're, you ended up at Stanford, academics is something that's very important to you. So it's one of those things where I look at that and I say, I'm really curious. That that could end up being a really good fit. No, I, I like that a lot. And then the other one that I kind of want to mention that entered the portal today was Nair Jackson at uh, Florida Atlantic or FIU. Um, that's because he's a play guard. He plays right guard. Yeah. That, especially when you think about the Oregon game, you mentioned that. Like, that's a position where, and I think kind of correcting myself a little bit, and I'm glad you meant, you know, clarified it towards the end of the, yesterday's show. Taking from the G6 and the G5 is probably a better solution than going all the way down to the FCS. Now, there are certain, obviously, guys sure. that, like Sebastian Ballard has proved, you can make that jump, but it's a little bit less of a jump. And you look at, I mean, tell me if you don't like this right away. 296 potential uh, total. Set, you know, opportunities to be give up a sack, two sacks allowed, 12 pressures at right guard. When you That's talk solid. about Enoch Vimahi, like what he did this season, again, it wasn't perfect. He battled some injuries a little bit, but that return on investment from Ohio State, getting a guy who had never started a full season before, now you're talking about a guy who's played two full seasons at, at a lower level school. You can say, hey, this guy plugged and played right away. Landon goes back to center. You can deal with the guard, the left guard position, however you want, if guard comes back or not. But you look at that right guard position, and there's there's bodies that are going to be competing for that spot. So it's not just going to be given to Nair Jackson or anybody else that they bring in the portal. But that's one where it just seems like if you can go get a plug and play two year starter, even at a G five school, that might be the better route. Because not that D'Angelo was bad this season, but I think Jed kind of touched on it throughout the season of like, hey, there's bringing in high school guys, bringing in FCS guys, and then bringing in P five and, and G G five guys and P four guys and G five guys. Right. There's a significant difference in each one, not a ton but enough to where that might be one or two games difference if you add enough of those bodies. I, I really like where you're going with that. But Lars, now we got to take a look at the other side of the transfer portal and what might be leaving from Washington's roster. Which we'll get to right after a message from our good friends over at Game Time, because Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes it tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats, so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets, which is great news for anybody who wants to go check out the Husky basketball play. Danny Sprinkles got his team off to a good start. The Kraken, the Seahawks, there's so many great tickets that you can find over on the Game Time app because the Game Time Picks creation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and so much more. With all in pricing, you can toggle this feature to show the total upfront with no 
no surprise fees at checkout. And with seat views, you can get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets, game time picks, down the game time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for twenty dollars off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. So, Lars, let's look at the other side of this, where guys are going to come into Washington for the transfer portal and guys are going to leave. And when I look at it, we saw Jack McAllister announced by the time we recorded, it's 3.30 on Monday as we record this, uh, Jack McAllister is the only person who has publicly announced that he's going to be leaving Washington. I feel like we're going to see a couple others. We don't necessarily need to speculate and give names. I think positions are probably going to be the best way for us to go about this, just for all the everydays out there, just to talk, let, let everybody know how we decided to plan this out because we don't want to say, hey, we think this guy is leaving. It's it's not fair to them either way, no, no matter what we might be hearing. Absolutely. Yeah, and again, it's more or less, you just kind of look at, I mean, here's a safe way to do this. Look at the 25 class, look at the number of guys coming in at each position, and then do some math. Yeah. Where you look at running back would be one where you're bringing in two because you got you got, you added uh, Jill McMahon and Carr, so now you're thinking about and okay, you're losing one and you're or no you're losing two you're losing you're losing two yeah right well two and then plus you could lose a, t- a potential third like when you looked at how those I'm just talking about were. no sorry I'm just talking specifically about uh, just guys that are out of eligibility where Cam Davis Daniel and Gata are gone like I'm just saying go about it that way and you can still you know do math with, in terms of other guys that might be on the roster. Right, exactly. And then you look at, you probably, I mean, you would think you wouldn't lose an offensive lineman, but I wonder, you know, just one of the two at left guard, knowing you have Max as well, and Drew's going to at least compete for that starting job next year, because I know they tried Max at right tackle a handful of times, you know, loosely in warm-ups, yeah. Thomas Spring and, and fall camp do that. How does that potentially look? I think one of those guys might transfer out, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if none of them do, because again, give one, give yourself one more year and Maybe after spring camp or in this in the April period when it opens up, you can say maybe those go they go then. But the one position for me that has to be hit aside from defensive tackle is linebacker. But you know, you look at well, first of all, the one thing about Jack McAllister is he's not a scholarship guy, so it doesn't impact the 85. So when you look at scholarship guys, sure. tight end might be a position where you have some attrition, more so maybe for health reasons. I'm not saying Charlie Crow, I'm just saying, you know, somebody else in that room. I just I'm not gonna name the name, but it's just, you know. Naturally, you look at positions where, you know, I don't think an edge would transfer out, but I could kind of see where maybe one I of those guys that. wants a little bit more reps, right? Where the, the, Again, we're not going to name names, but it's just you look at a certain, you know, player X, and it's like he should have gotten more snaps. He wasn't on the availability report. So what's kind of the situation here, how much of that is scheme and how much of that is game dependent? But a lot of it really is – if it's – you don't want to say this the wrong way, but – it's not addition by subtraction, but it's almost kind of like it's, you know, it's transactional. It's like the NFL where, Hey, we need to add a guy over here and we can lose a guy over here and be okay. I wonder about the safety position where there's going to be a lot, there's some guys coming back. You graduate both cam and, um, and Mikel potentially, but Mikel could come back as well. So that's yep. another you know, situation to monitor. You look at the cornerback position. The, like It's going to be like leveling up where, you know, you see some guys that didn't get a ton of run at Oregon. You saw a bunch of guys get a ton of run at Oregon that necessarily hadn't throughout the season. And you wonder, Hey, was that a last chance to get some game film for some guys to potentially transfer out? <laughs> but it's going to be, I don't, I, I don't necessarily think there's going to be a surprise position. Like we're not going to look and see like, Oh wow. Like two defensive tackles transferred out. Like I don't, I don't think that's going to be the case. It's more going to be like selective. Like, Hey, we're going to swap one for one. We're going to do this for that. Not necessarily guys getting run off it's just kind of like look you want to go play somewhere else like um devon banks perfect example where a yeah, guy you could yeah. be a, a backup in washington and, and compete for a spot or you could be a full-fledged starter at a p at a g5 school and be in the position to make the college football playoff in back-to-back years now again granted he was right. hurt last season so he didn't play in it but the point being that's the other side of this equation when we talk about guys transferring out it's not like oh they don't want to play for jed or their jed ran them out it's just sometimes you just kind of mutually part ways so I, I like where you're going with that, and especially with the Devon Banks reference, because cornerback was one position that I wanted to talk about, where, you know, we really like the young guys in that room, and there are a lot of them, but it's one of those things where you get to a certain point that, and it's, oh, there's pr- probably too many guys in here, and there's not enough spots, and somebody's going to want to go look for playing time, somebody might want to be closer to home, whatever these factors are, there are a whole bunch of different 
things that people will weigh in terms of entering the transfer portal. It's not all monetary. Like I, that, that's, that's something that I, I feel needs to be said. Not all of this is monetary where somebody saying, I want to go get a better deal somewhere else. It's sometimes it is, Hey, I'm not getting the reps that I thought I would. And I've been here two, three years now, or I simply I'm homesick and I want to go play closer at home. These are all things that happen. So corner is a position where I could see that happening. There are a lot of young guys there and I like them. And, you know, you think about three true freshmen coming in at that position as well, where you and I are really high on Dylan Robinson. He's somebody who could, you know, vault up the depth chart pretty quickly. That would, you know, when, when something like that happens, it's great because you want to see that young talent, but at the same point, it's going to push somebody who's a little bit older in that room down. Like that's, that's just the reality of the situation. So that's a position where I'm looking at that. I'm glad you mentioned edge rusher where that's another one where that's certainly very, very possible. But on top of that, I'm, I'm curious about what the situation is going to be at. There, there, there are too many to really just, I, I'm curious about wide receiver. Like that's, that, that's the one that I'm, I'm looking at where there are a lot of young guys in this room and I really like them. You're still bringing in a whole bunch of guys from the freshman ranks as well, where let's say Giles, because Giles out of eligibility, Jeremiah is probably going to be going to the draft as well, where you look at that and you say, all right, you're bringing in a whole lot of guys and that's a lot of really healthy competition. But I, and this is why we're not naming names. Somebody is going to, at the, at some point have to be the odd man out, whoever it is, somebody is going to be the odd man out at some point. And you're going to say, Oh, why was it this guy? Or why was it that guy? That's just sometimes the way that it works. Absolutely. Well, and spe- honestly, kind of a name that one that it's not necessarily a name, it's just a situation. What do you do if you're Shaker Kendall? The sure. fact that Damon has been almost annoyed at the starter. Do you want to just pigeonhole yourself into being a number two guy, even though you were the, became the number three this season? Like that situation to me, because you're bringing in Dash Beerley and um, Tristan Keeney McMillan, one in yeah. January, one. I'm, I don't know if McMillan's enrolling in January or in March or in June. But I would imagine it's probably one of the latter two, March or June, just because that'd be kind of an interesting choice to enroll two freshmen that you had last year and then DeMarcy has transferred out. So to me, that's going to be an interesting situation because DeMar will be a true sophomore, which is fine, and you have two freshmen. But if Shea wants to go play, you know, get you know, earn his playing time, and especially a quarterback, like that's the one position where it's like, look, if I'm not getting reps and I'm not getting practice time and I'm not getting playing time, even in some small manner, what is there to gain? Now, Jed will say, well, develop to become an NFL quarterback and we'll go down the road. But if DeMond's your starter, Shaker Kendall's never starting bar- barring injury. So sure. I, I don't, I don't want to name him as a name specifically, but it's a, it's a quarterback dilemma that, you know, do you go the JC route if he ends up going out? Because you're going to want another quarterback in that room who's got some experience where, like, there's no slight to Dash or to McMillan, but you're talking about three quarterbacks, and if Demond, given how much of a runner he is, if he gets hurt, you know now you're talking about throwing one of the two freshmen in next year. It's like when you're talking about building the program and trying to ascend, you kind of Demond needs that you know older kind of voice to be like, hey, you know I'm a JUCO quarterback, let me help you break down. So not that Demond can't, but it's just it's good to have that second, third set of eyes, kind of like what Will was in a grander sense this season. Sure. So I, I like where you're going with that. And I think that we should end this conversation by talking about the offensive line, where that's another position where I look at it a lot like I do at wide receiver. And I say, all right, they're with, you know, the amount of guys that are coming in right now from the high school ranks, like that's one part of this equation. But also, if you want to make sure that you can have guys that can compete this season, you're probably going to want to make sure that you have room for them on the roster. And if that's, you know, saying, hey, we, you know, this is a guy we thought we were going to be able to work with, but for one reason or another, it hasn't worked out very well. These are also situations that happen in college football. And again, is why we didn't want to name names, where it's whoever that might be, right? You, you can sit down with Jet Fish and Brennan Carroll and this coaching staff could sit down with any of the guys and say, hey, how are you feeling about where you are right now? This is what our plan is for you. Because Jed said that's what they're going to do with every player over the course of this week. And if we see one or two players from the offensive line hit the transfer portal, I personally wouldn't be overly surprised. And it's one of those things where all of a sudden that frees up, hey, we want to make sure that we're going to go take an experienced body, like we talked about in the opening segment, to take up that spot. So that's that's just another thing that I think we should be keeping an eye on and just everybody out there should say, all right, if this is the situation that happens with, again, insert X player here, 
it's probably because there's something bigger at play. Yeah, and especially when you talk about offensive line, like, you know, given the woes that happened last spring and everything like that, but there's also a progression that you need to hit where if you have three-fourths or even half of your offensive line is underclassmen, I'm talking like redshirt freshmen, freshmen, or, you know, even redshirt sophomores that, you know, haven't even gotten a ton of game time, but, you know, for the most part, it's the freshman and redshirt freshmen. You know, what What are you doing at that point? Because Jed Member said he's enrolling 16 guys early in January. So some yeah. of this roster can change now and some of it can change after spring camp. That's where I'm going to be curious. Do they stick around for spring camp and then decide, Hey, you know what? I'm not, I'm going to be left tackle three or four this season. I'd rather go to a G five and earn, you know, a full starting rep and then try and transfer again down the road because you can sure. transfer twice at least. Right. And that's, and that's an interesting part of this where these are all things that are going to be monitored. And Lars, the best place for everybody to just make sure they're up to date on that. It's right here on Lockdown Huskies because we're going to be switching gears for a little bit because we need to talk some basketball. Which we'll get to right after message from our good friends over at FanDuel. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. So visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll start with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. And I just want to say shout out to longtime, uh, just an MVP guy that we've had going, that MVP, Josh Allen, that whatever you want to call that play where it throws it to Amari Cooper, gets the lateral and scores a touchdown. That is an MVP worthy play right there. And that's why we've been pumping him up right here. You can go check out his MVP odds and so many more over on FanDuel. Lars, we haven't talked basketball since the Nico Bandalo commitment. And that, first of all, that was something that came out of nowhere for the both of us as well. Oh, please. Yeah. Signing. Yeah. Not and signing. Commitment. Yes. Commitment yes. And no, signing. no, because I will say at Danny Sprinkle's press conference on Monday, didn't walk himself into an uh, NCAA violation because he was asked about, you know, being hot on the recruiting trail and kind of beating around the bush because it wasn't necessarily totally clear that he was signed. But then he's like, yeah, I think you're talking about Nico. And it's like, yeah, that, that, that's the yeah. guy. And yeah, like that's that was significant. <laughs> There's one thing to get a commitment. It's another thing to get him and sign. Because to your point, Danny, I, I, I'll just kind of offer up because I don't know if you've gotten a chance to hear it. But Danny said that he basically went on official visits to UNC, Ohio State. Yep. There was one or two North other North Carolina schools. and Michigan State. Yep. And apparently, oh no, no, school- sorry, UConn was in there. UConn was one of them. Y- yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. UConn because UConn was actually the first one he listed, but uh, with that Sprinkle listed. But what was interesting and kind of telling was apparently, well, this is again according to Danny Sprinkle, after those visits took place, they weren't feeling it. Like there was no, like he wasn't feeling any of those schools, and so apparently Washington had been able to kind of make up a lot of headway really quick because he wasn't intrigued or you know, whatever they had sold him on. The other schools sold him on was not appealing. And, the fact that, you know, this this isn't a bag chasing situation. This is a, hey, look, this is a four who can play right away next year. And you look at the four position, yeah. Wilhelm gone, great gone. All these guys are going to be gone. And so that's an impact guy at a stretch four position that can shoot tough defense. It's the exact kind of guy Danny Sprinkle needs in the paint. Yes, exactly. And that might not be the only one where – Mohamed Sila on Sunday night puts out his top five and includes Washington. That's the top uncommitted center in the nation. He's ranked number 30 in the country right now by 247 Sports. And it seems like Washington's in a really good position with that guy as well. Where I did some math, I went on the, the old class calculator last night. And if Washington is able to scare a commitment from him too, that Lars, that rock, rockets Washington in the top five. That puts them as the number four recruiting class in 2025 in Danny Sprinkle's first, you know, full recruiting cycle with this team. And that would be just insane. Where that's that's what we've been looking for, for some kind of boost from the basketball team. And like th- this is all the off court stuff because we need to talk about what they look like on the floor as well. But seeing all those things, it's a really great sign that. You know, when he came on this year podcast over the summer, we talked about the energy. We talked about everything that he was building. And, you know, the, this is the way I, I want to segue this into talking about winning the Acrisure Invitational is it took a little bit of time. We saw, you know, the first couple of games, 
it was, oh, this is kind of sloppy. This looks like a team that hasn't played together. They're, they're not shooting very well. They, they need to get better. And Danny was very upfront about that, to his credit. Like, that's one of my favorite things about listening to him talk is he is very open and honest where he will say, yeah, I think great needs to play better. I don't think he's playing very well right now. I think we need to be better at this. We need to be better at that. He doesn't, he doesn't mince words. And we've seen the result of that. We've seen him, his team improve in leaps and bounds. And with, like, I know they're quad three in terms of where the NCAA net rankings are right now, but Colorado state and Santa Clara, those are solid wins for a team that, you know, we saw what they looked like against a division two Seattle Pacific team. They're trailing by 13 points at one point like this, this team is improving and it looks like everything is headed in the right direction before they play UCLA on Wednesday. And perfect segue into that. You did it on the road, the Seattle Pacific yeah. game being at home. It's like, there's no reason that should have happened, but okay. You know, you got the wake up call and you win by double digits, but then to go, cause the thing for me is you look at the Nevada game where they lost that in the late, you know, last five minutes or so where they go on a 10 0 run. Nevada goes on a 10 0 yeah. run, wins the game. That didn't happen. Now Sprinkle pointed out that could have happened against Colorado state where the, you know, the free throws were a little bit of an issue there late in the game, but then against Santa Clara, cause it's one thing I asked him was, you know, free throws, are you feeling, positive about it because it seemed like against Santa Clara Makai Mason hit both great hit both it just seemed like when you needed to ice the game away late with you know getting you know if the other team is in foul trouble might as well take advantage of it because we've seen Washington be able to go cold at times you know from the floor and so what's the best solution going cold from the floor drive get to the paint get physical be physical and then it kind of builds on the mentality and I think that's what we both love about Sprinkle is he is an established head coach. Now, he's only been there for five years, so I'm not saying he's like, you know, Jim Beheim or anything like that, but no no particular reason I mentioned that. But um, you, you talk about, you know, he knows what he wants to do. He's emphasized, hey, you know, I don't want to go get a massive amount of guys in the portal. He has – and you see the improvement game to game where Colorado State, not that great from the free throw line. You, Santa Clara gets a little bit better. And, you know, you're starting to see as you go along. Now the UCLA test is going to be real because – Big Ten play and what they've had in, co- in non-conference play, there's a significant gap in talent there. Now, they've been good teams. Andrew Sprinkle, but, hey, you know, they can have a guy that scores 15 or 25 and the guy ends with 13. It's like, okay, like, was he as good? Did you guys shut him down? And it's about building on that consistently as well. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's, that's the biggest thing. And that consistency needs to be seen on both ends of the floor. Where when I look at it, like, you know, we've seen Tyler Harris have some explosions that he really took a step back in the the – game against Santa Clara, but it's just those things where you want to see those things build consistently. And I look at, you know, just what this backward situation looks like. It's nice to see Zoom Diallo taking a step forward. We know we're not going to see Frank Kepdon for another couple of weeks. Uh, I, I I know I put it out there over on Husky's Wire where just from the way Danny Sprinkle said he had a t- knee procedure, everything's okay. We're happy with the way everything looks right now. The doctor's really happy. And we just want to make sure a couple of things were cleaned up. And he said a few weeks the timeline I put that at right now after doing some math is December 18th would be the date I would expect to see Frank step on the floor again, where I, I look at all that and I say, okay, this seems like a step in the right direction. And it's not necessarily about holding water where you play UCLA and USC over the next week. Like you've got some, some quality opponents coming up where it's, if you're able to just continue building on that success and we see Tyler Harris continue to take a step forward, DJ Davis start to get more consistent, Makai Mason, somebody else in that, just in that backcourt start to step up a little bit more as a scorer while Zoom Diallo, Luis Courtright, Tyree Nacho just start to learn their roles a little bit better because we've seen them play a little bit better. I love watching Luis Courtright on defense. That dude is a lot of fun to watch. He plays with really good energy. And then as this team continues to come together, Lars, the X factor in all this is Dominic Diamande where it looks like he's probably close to arriving. He might've done so already by this point in time, just in terms of some recent comments he made in an interview with pro insight, I I believe was the the outlet, but you put all those things together. And if you're able to have that little extra mid season, just nudge, I I, want to say this is a team that could take a big step forward over the next month or two. Yeah. I mean, that's an intriguing yeah, acquisition when when he when he does you know step foot on campus and you know suit up for a game because you then kind of factor in the other side of the equation where he's still got to get up to speed with the guys and you know 
because if he's doing online school, which I think the story said, it, that means he's not practicing at Washington. I guess if he's practicing at Washington doing online school, that'd be kind of weird. So I feel like, right. you know, it's one of those where he's going to take, there's going to be an adjustment period. I do want to clarify. I, I do believe Danny Sprinkle said probably after the first of the year for uh, Kepnon, but that could be, you know, a couple of weeks, end of December, maybe late December. But I, the way that he said after the new year, to me, we probably think, you know, early January, but either way, if he can come back earlier, that'd be better. But you look at all these pieces and they're what six and one, seven and one. Like you're, you're talking about a team that now, oh yeah, the schedule lined up for them pretty well, but they could have lost what, three, four of those games. They could have sure. lost, you know, both the Akersher games. They could have lost, you know, a handful of a couple of others. South Pacific, I wouldn't say they would have lost because I would expect them. UMass Lowell not- was close. Like that's. And so, but, but they're good character wins because you're still getting the win at the end of the day. And you would hope that the confidence to come out with a win builds on itself. And that kind of seemed like what happened in the Akersher. Yeah, I agree where it's just, it's all like, I remember watching the, that game on Thanksgiving, just, okay, it's all loading. It's all going in the right direction where this is what you want to see is just a nice, strong performance that you can build off because I feel like we did see them get better against Santa Clara. And now it's just kind of, all right, you're going from, you know, a, a team that's, that's still solid to a really, really good team in UCLA. And moving forward is just, that's, that's the question where you look at just the net rankings in terms of the big 10 Washington's 14th, like out of the 18 teams where the, they, again, still have, haven't necessarily played a top notch competition, but there, there are some really good teams that are coming down the pipeline that you need to be prepared for. Yeah, and I think, you know, one question I wanted to ask Brinko but didn't get a chance to, ended up asking him about free throws instead, which was, you know, what was the thought process when building the schedule? Outside of Nichols Day, which, you know, canceled the game and all that, it's, you know, you're you're obviously, you're kind of, you're you're thinking about it as buy games, so you should, you're buying a win effectively. But you do also want to test yourself, and I think there's been enough balance of both to where I agree. it's not been Washington struggling. I mean, in part, they have been struggling. But it's also like, hey, you know, you're defending a good three-point shooting team. You're defending a team that has a guy in the post. So there's mixing and matching, and you're not just, you know, going and saying, hey, we're just trying to get an easy win here. Because that does not help you as much as playing in these invitationals and playing Nevada and then playing UMass Low, where it's like, hey, we might not have a lot of familiarity with him. That's fine. Like you haven't played a lot of guys, a lot of teams when you go to the NCAA tournament. There's not history there, and you got to just learn on the fly. And so I think it's good practice in that sense long term. Lars, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all every day for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Huskies your first listen today. Now for your second listen, check out the Lockdown Big Ten podcast. Our guy Craig Sheeman puts Big Ten first. When everyone else overlooks it, you can find Lockdown Big Ten on YouTube or wherever else you listen to your podcast, which is also where you can find this show. So make sure you, just, you subscribe wherever you get your podcast. So that's YouTube, Spotify, Epping's Game Sound Music. We're there. We're everywhere. We're updating this channel through content every single day. So make sure you click that like button, click the little bell so you never miss when we post new video. If you have any questions, comments, concerns up right down below in the comment section and if you're audio only please leave us five star reviews it does help us out a lot thank you so much for tuning in and we'll talk to you on wednesday